Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. And I'm Christine Zernheld, aka Shep. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock. Here on November 22nd, 2019. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news shows each and every Friday morning. We read all the news. So you don't have to. And first up, we've got a little housekeeping here today. We had our little giveaway for some Marketing O'Clock co-branded SEJ shirts. And those are out at the printer. So if you filled out the form to win a shirt, spoiler alert, you probably won. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of entrants. But those are coming your way, so hang tight. And if you have a valid address, they are headed your way. And today's show is brought to you by Search Engine Journal's 2020 PPC Trends Report. The good folks over at Search Engine Journal Danny Goodwin specifically put together an amazing resource where he asked 39 of the top PPC marketing experts. The biggest experts. Well, 30. It was really hard to make the cut. (laughs) And myself was on there. Um, But they ran through a slew of questions. I think that there's over 150 pages in the final report. Um, It's phenomenal. It covers shopping, automation, keywords. John Kagan's out there trying to kill the keyword in this this argument, as he always is. But it's a fantastic download, and it is completely free. You can get that by going to searchenginejournal.com forward slash ppc dash trends dash 2020. Some nice fireside reading for the Thanksgiving break. A lot, yes. Get a little bit of that tryptophan in. As soon as you start nodding off, pick this up. You're going to get excited. You're not going to go to bed. You're going to make that Falcons game at night. All right. What do we have first up in the news, Shep? First up in the news, on November 20th, Google released an update on their political ads policy. They're limiting election ad audience targeting to the following general categories, age, gender, and general location. They went on to clarify that advertisers can continue to use contextual targeting, so that's placements, keywords, and topics, but this leaves out affinity audiences, in-market audiences, detailed demographics, remarketing, customer match, similar audiences, all those audiences you can't use for political ads now. The remarketing seems like it's something that would be good. If you've got somebody under your site and you're trying to get them to see actual details about your platform, like that part itself doesn't bother me that much. Saying that you have a custom audience that you upload, a customer match audience rather, um, that seems problematic to me. Mm -hmm. But saying you came to the site and now you might ask for a donation or something like that doesn't seem to be a problem. Everything else, I get it and seems pretty legit. Yeah, and I wish they would have saved us some work and said the explicit targeting types you couldn't use because they just listed the ones you could use and we had to go back and see the ones you couldn't. It was very confusing. But those are the ones that they don't mention in the article. And so you can use age, gender, general location. Mm -hmm. Which is gender, I don't know. That's interesting to me. Yeah, I don't know, everything. You'd think, you'd think it'd be location. Where mm-hmm. you're like, hey, you're a person. We're giving you this in your location where you can vote. Take everything else out of there. Mm-hmm. You know, like age and gender. I don't know. That, that's, that, to me, is sort of pandering to their advertisers. Right. And they also talk about the misinformation campaigns that we're all talking about every week. They say it's against Google Ads policy for any advertiser to make any face cl- false claim, including deep fakes. They say that explicitly. Any updates on shallow fakes? Um, they did not specifically mention shallow fakes. Okay. So this sentence in particular seems to be targeting Facebook outright. They're saying that if there's misinformation right th- out there, they're going to shut it down. And they list this example, which I hadn't really thought about before. They say, whether it's about the price of a chair or a claim that you can vote by text message, that election day is postponed or that a candidate has died, they're shutting down all misinformation. I didn't, like, that text message voting thing is kind of creepy. Like, I feel like people could fall for that pretty easily. If you saw that out there a lot. What kind of meanies are out there saying, oh, Joe Biden died? I know. I I, I honestly... (laughs) I'm t- maybe a little bit too wholesome to think that that exists, but yeah. seeing this, I get it. There are some people that will do anything out there. Because I was thinking about it just like targeting your opponent, but you could say something about the election in general that's not true, like when you have to register to vote or anything, and it could affect the election. Hey, so I use Sandra Bullock's uh, skincare line yeah. here. Look at me, it never looked better. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that made me think a little bit. They're also expanding their election advertising transparency efforts. They will now apply to U.S. state level candidates and office holders, ballot measures, and ads that mention federal or state political parties. These measures, which already apply to election ads in India, the EU, and for federal U.S. elections, include in ad disclosures and a transparency report that shows the content of an ad, who paid for them, how much they spent, and how much, how many people saw them. And how they're targeted, yes. right? Yep. Cool. So I can't wait to click on some political ads and get all that info. You know what? I can wait. And I'm not clicking on <laughs> any of them. <laughs> and thankfully, I won't be retargeted. Well, I guess yeah. I wouldn't have to visit a, a website to, uh, to, to do so. But So if you're running political ads, make sure you're well-versed on these policies. What else is happening this week? We've got more news from Google as Google Search Console will now report on data related to product-rich results. And this is something we talked about a few weeks back that if you put together product markup and even if you haven't put together product markup, if Google can identify that you have a product on your site, they're trying to make a more... No, a product feed based off of that that rich data. I've seen this in the wild quite a bit, and it's really, really nice. And maybe it's just because I'm so jaded from Google Shopping mm-hmm. that it's only ads. It, it is kind of strange when you see a listing or a search engine results page that has those shopping ads and then your products underneath. And then you click on products and you go to another search that just lists out those products and then more ads all over. Yeah. But I like the fact that they show the actual products right in the feed with um, imagery, which is pretty cool. So they're further supporting this. Websites that are eligible to appear in Google's product search results will find a new search appearance type called product results. This is awesome. I want to see more of this. I like the fact you can even report on it. And this, to me, as you've heard everybody that's listened for a while about me whining about shopping, it's a big problem that Google's had where unless you had ads, you didn't really have an, a, a voice for your product. Mm-hmm. So I like this. I like the fact they're going to have more reporting on it. The data can be segmented to discover so how shopping traffic changes over time, what search queries products show up for, and you can drill down even further to figure out how much came from uh, data like the price, availability, et cetera. You can see all that mixed in with your traffic so I fave this. Google's on our good side so far this week. Yes. Well, a lot of people are really liking the political stuff, but it's up to you. Yep. So I fave this prototype software manufacturer Google brand search console type report <laughs> name product results. I, That's rich data. Your nerdy jokes are amazing. <laughs> are they? <laughs> are they? Let's be honest. And next up, TripAdvisor has launched its first self-serve advertising platform. They're calling it Media Manager, and it's available globally to any marketers on the TripAdvisor platform, but it's specifically designed for small to medium-sized businesses. So I created an account and started playing around this with this a little bit. It's simple to use, which is great. Definitely seems geared towards small businesses. They have a cool PDF that shows you how to create a campaign. That might be the first time anybody's ever said it. They have a cool PDF. <laughs> <laughs> they did. There are a lot of images in it. I just get a PDF. I like the color like, oh, scheme. Oh, goodness. This thing's downloading. Oh, jeepers. I love a PDF with pictures. You can only pay for impressions with this so far. And for the targeting, they have destination retargeting, which is targeting people who are searching for a certain location, or they have behavioral targeting where they have a long list of different traveler personas. So they had business travelers, solo travelers, ski travelers, family travelers. Definitely check that out. They have a platform option, which is basically desktop or mobile. It is desktop or mobile, but you can't do both in a campaign. That's weird. (laughs) Who's like... Well, who thought of that one? <laughs> I don't know. It's like maybe a revolutionary one. It's I feel it's like binary. they have some bugs to work out. Yeah. yeah. So you have to create two separate campaigns if you wanted to target desktop and mobile. But go for it. I also tried to set up a dummy campaign, and I couldn't find New York City to target. Well, <laughs> wait. I mean, that's a pretty big city. Yeah, that seemed like a flaw. I typed in New York, and it came up with all these other cities in the state of New York, and then I tried New York, New York. You can't enter a zip code. Well, did you try a city with a greater population in the U.S.? I didn't. Okay. So you think maybe it's because it's too big? I don't think it's big enough. I'd go with a bigger city. 
No, Buffalo is on there. <laughs> oh, okay. So jury's out on this. It seems like they have a couple kinks to work out. I also don't love some of the recommendations they are they have on here. So for destination retargeting, I got this notification that said, select a targeting option according to the destination level you wish to target. The less granular the destination, the lower the price per impression. Okay, the lower the price per impression, but that's not to say that like your costs overall are going to be lower. Yeah, I don't care about costs. I care about value. <laughs> and TripAdvisor <laughs> is a very location-based service. So then I got another weird one. Destination retargeting allows you to reach users who have recently viewed a destination on TripAdvisor. Destination retargeting provides the most opportunity when applied to a less granular targeting option such as country or all destinations. That seems like as broad <laughs> as possible. All destinations? Even an entire country. Like TripAdvisor is for trips. Nobody's just visiting a whole country. Or well, all destinations. That's crazy to me. Well, who could do that? So I don't know. Maybe that dancing guy, you know, like where's Matt or whatever it is, who dances in all those countries. No, I don't know that guy. Maybe if you're targeting him, <laughs> you hit him in, in all destinations. So it just seems a little spooky that they're saying these things to these like less savvy people who are prob might not be working with an agency and they don't run a lot of campaigns. J don't take TripAdvisor's word for it. That be smart. That almost seems malicious to it say, does. oh, yeah, just target all destinations. <laughs> all destinations. That's insane. Yeah. Okay, what else is happening? Well, next up, we've got some news from Search Engine Journal and Matt Southern. And Bing, surprisingly, Bing has revealed that it has been using BERT in search results before Google. And it's also being used at a larger scale than Google. So shots fired yeah. by Bing. So Google's use of BERT in the search results is currently affecting 10% of the search results in the U.S. and featured snippets in up to two dozen countries. Bing is worldwide. <laughs> and my initial thought is that, A, kudos to Bing for using these transformers. We talked about it two episodes back if you want to learn a little bit more about BERT. Not all Transformers are created equal. <laughs> I have a lot of faith in Google's BERT just because I do a lot with Google Assistant and I can see how intelligent it is. And it just makes me wonder, like, Optimus Prime is a heckin' <laughs> tanker truck with a massive gun. And then there's a Transformer called Botanica. It's a <laughs> robot that turns into a house plant. Like, literally, all... Th those are both transformers. How do you know that? I Googled it. Okay. I binged it. <laughs> I bing birded it before the show. <laughs> That's true. But just because you're using these things doesn't mean that it's equal. And and I will give credit to Bing. Some of the results are much better than you've seen in the past. But there's a clear Burt Reynolds and a Burt Edwards. <laughs> and, and my money is on Google being Burt Reynolds. This just makes me think of like when an artist gets popular and people are like, I've been listening to them forever. Like Bert just had, a Bert, Bing just <laughs> had to make it clear that they knew Bert first. Yeah. Also, lastly, hey Bing, on your ads matching, can you just sprinkle a little, little dose of Bert around there too? Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. Now it's time for this week's take of the week. This is a hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. We simply deliver the take for your consumption. We give no opinions. We don't influence. You make the call. And this week's take comes from Amalia Fowler. Amalia E. Fowler on Twitter. And click on through and follow her in the show notes. And Amalia had this quote this week. I audited an account today made up of Google Builds. The ROAS was 0 0.04 for both assisted and direct revenue. The business spent $4,000 before asking for help. I wish Google understood the power behind the word Google and actually did what was best for SMBs. Hashtag PPC chat. Yikes. Yeah, Google's doing what's best for Google. 
at this point, yeah. Especially the sales folks that call and hound your clients, even in off seasons, like, oh, what can we do to uh, to get you to spend more? It's like, um, you can leave me alone because I'm not spending anything. We're not even running right now. It's insane. Yeah, I wish they were looking out for people more, them and now TripAdvisor. is doing the same thing, it seems. Yeah, but if you think doing an automated build from a Google rep is helpful, think again. Yeah. Take the time, pay the money, and pay for an audit or pay for setup. Contact somebody respectable in the biz and let them build this. Contact Amalia. Have her, yeah. pay her to set the accounts up for you the right way, and at least then you'll have a, a base from somebody that doesn't care about their own bottom line. It is borderline well, it's just problematic when you've got Google doing this, setting it up, and then you've got a return on ads about every dollar you put out, you make four cents. That's not what you want. No. <laughs> that, 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 you, don't, you don't even want a dollar and four. You don't want two dollars and four cents. I just, it, it's frustrating. And I, the, the point behind the word Google, when they let these yeah. other people email and hound your clients on their behalf using the name Google, it goes so far and it is so... It's such a bad experience. I don't know why you want to do that. It's so short sighted. And a to lot say, of the build time, this, yeah, lose ninety six percent of your money. You're not going to spend money anymore. And a lot of the time, they're not even from Google, which is the worst part. Yeah, your Regilex or whatever it is. That's, <laughs> that's where they're, they're they're typically from. So, hey, great take, Amalia. Keep them coming. Now it's time for this week's lightning round. At this point in the show, we split up our content into two parts, paid and non-paid. First, we'll cover everything to do with advertising, aka paid, and then report on the organic or non-paid. Here's what's happening in the paid universe this week. First up in paid, Snapchat is expanding the time limit for its mid-roll video ads to three minutes. Users will be able to skip the ads after six seconds, but... You won't have to cut them down like you used to. You'll be able to upla- upload your existing creative to Snapchat. As long as it's three minutes or less, you'll be able to have it on the platform, which is awesome. And we have more news from Snapchat. We got a lot of Snapchat news this week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have more coming. CEO Evan Spiegel said that the company will fact check political ads on the platform. Looking at you, Facebook. Ooh. That was me, not Evan Spiegel. <laughs> So we have three major social media sites now with three very different stances on political ads. So Facebook said they will not fact check. Twitter said they will not run political ads at all. And Snapchat said that they will fact check. So I just thought we'd play a little game. Um, It's called Evan Spiegel, Jack Dorsey, and Mark Zuckerberg. Which CEO am I talking about? And I'm just going to give you a fun fact. Can you guess who it is? Great. Okay, first. This CEO has red-green color blindness. Who, if it was good judgment blindness, I was gonna go Zuckerberg. <laughs> but red green, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Spiegel. It's Zuckerberg, and they said that's why the platform is blue because he can actually hmm, see. Makes it. sense. Okay. In his younger days, this CEO worked occasionally as a fashion model. Who? I'm definitely not gonna go at Jack. <laughs> not gonna go Zuck. I'm taking Spiegel. I'm going Spiegel again. It's at Jack. Wow. Why don't you think it was him? What are you saying? I just didn't, I didn't picture that. I pictured him. I pic, I, I could see Evan Spiegel really being a fashion model for some, some sleek glasses. And he's married to a model now. Well, I'm, 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 that's. Yeah. That would have been a good rationale. Okay, okay. Next one. This is my favorite. At one point, this CEO was reported having a short fling with recording artist Taylor Allison Swift. Numerous gossip columnists say he and Swift kissed each other at the 2014 New Year's Eve party. Okay. I can either go the game theory route and think that your answers are going to be evenly spread across everything and go Spiegel, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say Zuckerberg is too good for Taylor Swift. Out. Then I'm going to say it's between Jack and Spiegel. I think... Zuckerberg is not too good for Taylor Swift. Debatable. And then it's between Spiegel and at Jack. And I'm going to say it's a New York City thing, probably. I think it's Spiegel. It's Spiegel. All right. Okay, two more. This CEO lives in a house previously owned by Harrison Ford. Ooh. 
I am going to go definitely not Zuckerberg. I'm going to go Dorsey. Spiegel. Ah! I don't think you've gotten any right. I, I forgot to right. pay attention. Okay. I'm one for four. <laughs> okay, last one. This CEO walks five miles to work every day. Definitely not Mark Zuckerberg. This is Dorsey all the way. This mm -hmm. is at Jack. It's at Jack. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Black Mirror where it's the guy from the 70s show? Mm -mm. Topher, Topher Grace. Mm -mm. He reminds me of, of, <laughs> of at Jack in the Black Mirror episode. Also, it's a, maybe the worst Black Mirror episode ever. So okay. don't watch it. It's not an endorsement on it. It's just you can, you can, it, it plays a really good social CEO. Hmm. It's out there meditating. I'll have to not check that out. Yeah, don't check it out. Just take my word for it. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for playing. You failed. Thanks. Next up, Google introduced restricted data processing to help advertisers comply with the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA. What state is that for? California. Ooh, I know somebody that lives there. In Harrison Ford's old house. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the CCPA? It is a new act set to go into effect on January 1st that says certain businesses must give California residents the ability to opt out of the sale of their personal data on a business's homepage. Can I go off on a quick tangent here? Yes. I never understood the state versus the U.S. thing. Like this seems like it shouldn't be like a state decision to make. Like you can just be like, hey, only in the state. You can't do this stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe this should be the Internet. Maybe like a U.S. thing. And I think in the article it said it's similar to a policy that applies to the whole EU. Mm -hmm. But here it's a state. I don't get it's it It's just either. weird. Your state can be like, oh, abide by this. Like, all right. And then you probably have other states like, oh, no, just target away. We you should, should have just, like, Ar I was just in Arkansas. You should, Arkansas should be like, double target. Double target <laughs> our constituents. <laughs> Sorry to all you Arkansas folks out there. But like, if they could get a couple extra shekels for double targeting, I think they'd take it. <laughs> Jeez, I hope nobody from Arkansas is listening. So this applies to businesses that have annual gross revenue of at least $25 million, buy, receive, or sell personal data of at least 500,000 consumers, households, or devices. That's the thing. I mean, I think the, the revenue of $25 million is going to be a big barrier for most people. But if you've got 50,000 customers yeah that is what i think is actually going to tip the scale not that 50 the 200 or 25 million but more so the fifty thousand customers yeah. in your database i don't think the last one's going to be huge either derive at least 50 percent of their annual revenue from selling personal data i think most of it is going to be people who buy or sell at least fifty thousand. yeah that's like uh, cambridge analytica and maybe like a handful of others like the data warehouse folks <laughs> I, that's it's also just a weird business like exit 43 the data warehouse <laughs> go. what does your revenue makeup look like i'm like 51 percent just selling personal data <laughs> like, i got this warehouse in the back chuck's back there <laughs> he's got the personal data he'll schlop it up here for you what do you need that is creepy so google is preparing for this change by setting up this restricted data processing option if you if an advertiser opts in certain features such as adding users to remarketing lists will not be available in compliance with ccpa it may be implemented to apply to all users in california or on a per, per user basis when they click on the do not sell my information link on the advertiser's homepage. You can opt into this restricted data processing for Google Ads, Firebase SDK, and Google Analytics, and we will link to the article in our show notes telling you how to do so because it's different for all of those. Or just get out of California. <laughs> it seems easier at this point. Negative location on all your campaigns. Just set go. it up. And keeping it with Google, they announced a bunch of new features for shopping campaigns and local campaigns this week. In addition to store visits, more local business goals will be available, such as calls, or directions. Local campaign advertisers will soon be able to upload local product feed to feature in ads that will run in the display network. That sounds kind of cool. Local campaign advertisers can have their location show up when users are getting directions in maps and they're going to show up as little promoted pins. That's cool. Waze used to do Well, they still do do that. Yeah. That, that, that is something that's always really nice. I've done that before, a big campaign on that. Surprisingly good results. Really? Yes. That's kind of a fun one, too. They're also launching a new Boppus feature for shopping campaigns that run local inventory ads. Boppus? Yeah. 
Buy online, pick up in store. Nice. I, when you said bopis, I thought it was Latin for booping a dog. What is that when you touch their nose? Yeah, you just boop them. This is bopis, Latin. Where it originated from. I don't like from. dog noses are wet. It's not I really know. my thing. Yeah, bopis is fun to say, though. And it's just, you know, I love that feature. I hate going to the island store. It's my favorite thing in the world when you can just go to Target and pick up your order. What are your thoughts on those automated lockers? Well, actually, I know your thoughts on Home Depot. Which are really negative, but <laughs> but lockers in general. When you go and you pick up via a locker, I've never done it. Okay, I don't like it. For I've heard of it for Amazon, Home Depot does it. Yeah, at least around me, you can uh, buy something. They put it in a locker, but the locker's outside. It's like I don't want to buy paint and then pick it up in a locker in freezing cold temperatures. That seems like a terrible idea. But isn't it? You just have to get out your car quickly and get it right. I don't think I would mind that. Right, but I like the the buy and then pick it up at your leisure. I don't like just being. Oh, because like, oh, it's buy sitting it. out there in yeah, the it's cold. It's sitting in the cold, and you got this paint freezing. I don't want that. Yeah, I can understand I like that. It. Or what if it was groceries or something? I guess they well, could do cool. it with groceries. It's like a, a natural freezer, Earth's Earth's free refrigerator. I guess. So they already had this feature that said available in store, but now you can add it that it will say pick up today or pick up later. So that pick up today would have me clicking. And next up, Facebook is expanding their brand safety controls for advertisers so they can better control what type of publisher content their ads appear on. You can now create block lists for publishers you don't want to be associated with, get delivery reports, and set inventory filters at the account level. You used to only be able to do that on a campaign basis. You'll also be able to search for delivery reports by account ID or publisher without downloading it first. That sounds great. I never want to download anything. <laughs> Wait, I thought you like those PDFs that pop up on your phone. Well, those just pop up. That's a little different than downloading an Excel file. Okay. They're launching a content level whitelisting tool for advertisers working with Integral Ad Science, Open Slate, and I don't know how to say this one, Zephyr. Zephyr. Z E F R, which are Facebook's brand safety partners. And finally, they announced that they are beginning to test publisher whitelists for audience, network, and in-stream ads. Can I can I go Finstradamus on you mm -hmm. quick? I have a feeling that with these blacklists, we're going to be seeing in a coming cool tool the ultimate blacklist for your Facebook ads accounts coming soon. Somebody oh. should do that, right? That'd be great. You should do it, not me. <laughs> that would be great. Unfortunately, it's not going to be coming from me, so <laughs> it's a challenge to you, the listener. So that is it for paid. What's going on in non-paid? Well, we are going to keep it Facebook here. As Facebook is quietly releasing a new app, a meme-making app. Wow. Yes. So Facebook has released this. It's called a Whale, and it's an attempt to woo younger users. You know, overlay special effects over the text and photos. And the users can share the memes that they make on Facebook and other apps like Instagram or Messenger, according to the screenshots that the app shows. It was released last week and is only available on Apple's Canadian App Store, according to the <laughs> analytics firm Apptopia. Do you have I any love meme? memes in Canada? <laughs> do you have any? Me uh, do you, can you think about a meme for this app? Think about a meme. I'm going to run through a couple better ideas that I have than this app. So I've got an idea what they should do instead of this general meme-making app. They should do a meme-making app. Do you remember when Zuckerberg went to Washington and was sitting there and they turned him into like an alien-looking thing mm -hmm. and made him seem like he wasn't human, like he was an NPC? Everything should just be that. It should just be a Zuckerberg meme and app. And you add text over it? Yeah, but it's only Zuckerberg. Okay. That'd be funny. Mm-hmm. So that's one, and it's just the alien thing where he's like, I don't know what to do with this H2O and when he's got that glass of water and he's not a drink it. Like, that's funny. Or when he's like slimmed his face down and made it look like an alien. That's funny. Or the one where it's Zuck teaching a kid something. Do you know that meme? I have, I have a, in the show notes, if you look, there's a picture of a kid looking at a computer, <laughs> looking back, <laughs> saying something about something that, that Zuckerberg should have no idea about, and then he comes over the top and one-ups him. So the kid says... Like something like, my dad says you're spying on us. And Zuckerberg says, he's not your dad. That would be a good meme. Just those memes. Just Zuckerberg memes. Or another idea is a meme. 
you put, you, have you ever seen those like domain name generators where you don't have an idea and you put something in and it spits out some web 2.0 name? It's just a business name. But you put a business name in and it spits out a new name. So give me a name of a business. Um, Shep's Taylor Swift Shirts. Swept's Taylor <laughs> Swift Shirts. And it's ads on the end from Facebook. Oh. That'd be a funny that'd be a funny app. I'd use that. <laughs> I'd take that. You do it and I'd be like, oh boom. Just ads from Facebook to everything. <laughs> All right. So th- thinking about a meme for this. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? <sighs> you like memes, right? I like Real Housewives. I, I like memes that I'm like familiar with. Like I don't get the one that's going around right now with the Real Housewives and the cat. I don't either. Can somebody explain it? And the other one where it's like I'm going to tell my kids that this person is this person too. Oh, yeah. Do you, I, like, I don't, there was uh, a good Real Housewives one with that where it was like the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and Andrew, Adrian Malouf was at the table and I think it was right before she quit the show and it said, I'm going to tell my kids this is the Last Supper. I really <laughs> like the Real Housewives one, but I don't get the ones okay, with the Okay, so cat. we're doing Real Housewives meme one here. <laughs> Zuckerberg says, and it's a Real Housewives lady. What's her name? Adrian Malouf. Adrian Malouf. And she says, we need a new app. Oh, the cat one? No, yeah. sorry, that's Taylor Armstrong. Oh, Taylor Armstrong. So Taylor, you, you just love these Taylors. So Taylor says, we need a new app to cater to the kids. And then the cat says, memes. <laughs> it's great. And then it's hidden inside of exhibit saying. That actually is a good one. <laughs> but then we need an exhibit to say, yo, I heard you like memes. You put memes in your memes. <laughs> Right? That's good. No? <laughs> okay. I guess I don't get memes. Okay. I don't know. Well, you, you should talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> she likes them or she doesn't. Oh, she, she hates them and she hates it anytime I show her anything that's a meme. You should frame some in the house. That'd be fun. I know how that'd go over. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'll make a meme for this and put it in the show notes. Is that how it's going to go? <laughs> she'd be the cat in that meme. That's what she'd be like, okay, look. I'm Taylor Johansson. What's her name? Taylor? Taylor Armstrong. Taylor Armstrong. Look at this. I got a new meme for the house. And she'd just be the cat, not eating at her plate. Filing divorce papers. All right. <laughs> Next up, it's from Data Studio. There's new improved data modeling for data sources. And so Google has improved how fields for any data sources are defined and aggregated by default. These changes make it easier to model data and to make those fields more robust. You can hop in there and it won't change any previous reports that you've done. So charts and calculated fields that you've already done will work as before this upgrade, but you can basically hop in and there's an aggregated column in the data source that will now say default aggregation. So this is going to be what's used when you include that field in a data suit report unless it's overridden. So cool um, for you data studio nerds. <laughs> And now we're going to get back to Mr. Spiegel, who once kissed uh, Taylor Swift. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Was it Jack? Who Allegedly. Was it? it was Mr. Spiegel. Okay. Allegedly. Alleged. Thank you for including that alleged there. Very professional of you. So eMarketer has some good news for Snap investors. Snapchat is seeing growth again, but not where you'd expect it. It's not Gen Z and Hope over there. It's not us. It's a different generation. It's boomers. Can we say that anymore? Is it oh, problematic you think at this it's point? it's a bad word now? I don't know if it's problematic. Just say baby boomers. That's, baby boomers. Okay. Baby boom. Well, the, the article said boomers. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just reporting facts, folks. I, I'm starting to feel bad when people make the hey boomer thing. Like the Slack thing you said today, it's a little mean. Yeah, in case you didn't see it, apparently Microsoft Teams, A, both of these ads stunk. We're going to put it in the show notes. <laughs> But Slack made an ad showing marbles rolling through like marshmallow fluff. And then Microsoft somehow did the same exact ad with different color marbles. And yeah. then Slack OK boomered Microsoft. It's and then just, like people stuck up for Microsoft, which is weird. If you read the comments, everybody's like, oh, Microsoft's good. It's- I feel like we're definitely getting to a point where like there's corporate announcements coming out that you can't say okay boomer anymore like it's getting <laughs> yeah. a little out of hand uh, we probably somebody's listening to this and we're probably canceled in 2025 yeah. because of this podcast right mm-hmm. here so <laughs> well at least it was a good six-year run but <clears throat> since 2018 snapchat's user base had a decline of 1.4 percent in 2018 but in 2019 snapchat's user base has grown by 14.2 percent the biggest source was baby boomers 
where they had a growth of 13% in 2019. So business is booming. And I've got a million dollar idea for Snapchat. Okay. Snapchat, do what Facebook does. Steal other people's ideas. We need a meme app that just puts from Snapchat and everything. Okay. That's all you need. Take, take Facebook's idea. This, it's kind of what happened to Facebook. Like, I don't know the hard numbers, but it seems like everyone on there now is your parents and grandparents. So it makes sense that it's happening with Snapchat. I've, yeah, I've got to respond to a party. Inv- I'm not on Facebook. And somebody asked me, asked me to respond to Facebook. I'm like, ah, i got to get on there and uh, respond to a party invite. I can't, what about, whatever happened to Evite? Is that still around? I have never had an Evite invitation in my life. I don't know if it's the time's changing or just that I don't get got, invited to a lot of stuff. I've have kids, never had invites. an Evite. Okay. I still get an Evite like once a year. I'm like, I, I, I appreciate this. For kids' birthday parties? Yeah. It's, it, and, but then you're like, ah, oh, it's a spam Evite. Who's using Evite? And it's a whole thing. It's a whole deal. Okay. All right. Something that is a better deal is what Google has done to optimize their product Optimize. And Google Optimize can now understand when a customer has returned to a site that they visited before and deliver a consistent site experience. This is something that we could do with ads on Optimize, but now you can do it based on UTM parameters, which is cool. So it doesn't just have to be used with Google Ads. So a good example is that they gave in the blog post, again, head over to the show notes to see it. But if you've got a holiday campaign, you can use a discount offer and add in a UTM campaign parameter called holiday sale. And optimize, you then put in the parameter rule holiday sale, and then it, the experience and the pricing will be the same for who That's really cool. got the email. I've never thought about it with pricing before. That's neat. Yeah, so you send that email out with the different price for your email subscribers. They click on through, optimize, you set it up to change that price, and it, it, it's the same experience. Wow. All right, next up is an article. Honestly, I had to read three times in order to get anywhere. I didn't under, I literally didn't understand it. And you ever seen the memes? You're like a big fan of memes, right? <laughs> ever seen the meme where you're like, my age is, and then you say something? This should be my ages. I had to read this article three heckin' times to understand what it was about. Okay. So the article is about the rise of popularity of virtual influencers. Did you know what a virtual influencer was before this article? I did not, but I only had to read it once. Okay. So I thought a virtual influencer was somebody that could influence online, but then in real life, like... You would never take their recommendation. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, a virtual influencer. I just made that deduction. Yeah. I'm like, none of this makes sense. I looked at it again. There are all these people in there, and they're like wearing fancy really clothes. Really beautiful people. Very nice yeah. people. And I'm like, okay, I still don't understand what's happening. These people probably could sell some product in real life. I read it again. These people aren't people. They're not people. They're virtual people. They're like it's holograms, creepy. monograms. What, what are they? They're fake people. I don't know. Are they like taking AI. real people and editing them, or are they really just completely fake? I don't get, or like combining They're multiple people. They're completely fake people that are CGI. They're not actual humans. They're like these made up things. They're like NPCs. I want to know about like how much money it takes to make the images and what their int- return on investment is for these if you, if brand you, partnerships. I, I want to too. The number of followers some of these fake people have, these, there's accounts that are, Around a person, it's like a ro- It's like a robot. They're not. Re- they're not human. They're things that look like human. They're up to that. I mean, I follow uncanny- Barbie. That's a little bit different. That's a product. I don't think you're like. Oh, look at this. Barbie's an influencer, though. She like travels the world. Where was she last? Um, I haven't seen it in a while. Why haven't I? That's weird. They must oh. have changed the algorithm or something. I'll tell you why. Because she got one upped by some of these other folks. Mainly, I am Laquella, Limaquella, who has 100.1 million quality audience followers. And if you go to the account, it's not a real person. I don't even know how to describe it. But it this. doesn't say anywhere in the profile or anything that it's a fake person either. The one girl said she was a recording artist and there were music videos. 
but she's a, a computer program. Like who 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 follows who follows this? Not who's like me? I'm really into a fake computer generated recording. I don't. This is where I get to the point. I'm sick. This makes zero sense. I don't understand it. I'm old man Finn here. I'm a codger. Yeah, and why would you take the recommendation for any products they were selling? They're not real people. And why are you like, hey, I'm a big brand. I'm gonna go over to a synthetic human mm-hmm. and like. Then do you like ship real shoes over there? Like, what do you do? Do you just say, hey, mock these fake shoes That's up? That's a good point. How, how do you even influence to a fake person? Or if, if it was like beauty products, they're not using beauty products. You probably, other... probably have to pay in Bitcoin. Probably. You cracked it. <laughs> okay. Or what's the crypto kitty? <laughs> yeah, it's just crypto kitties. All right. Well, anyway, read this article because I am the wrong person to report on. On virtual influencers that are CGI people that brands are paying and then do you make the checkout to these people like who do you make the checkout to (laughs) there are so many logistical concerns (laughs) i i hate it get rid of it all right next up image search click data it's been dropped by google search console google said that there was a bug of some sort that resulted in google search console dropping data the dates were between november 14th and november 19th so go ahead and annotate that in your ga and this should have no impact in your rankings and your traffic. It's just a bug in Search Console. Good news. I bet they're going to have a fire Thanksgiving doodle. Oh, over. I'm sure. All right. News from Twitter is next. Twitter has launched tweet scheduling directly on Twitter.com. You previously could do this through Twitter with TweetDeck or many other tools. But you can now head right over to the web interface and schedule this on Twitter. So cool. What about editing? <laughs> Sadly, no. That was not in the announcement. But anyway, let's give a big hand to Twitter. Welcome to 2015. <laughs> All right, next up, if your recipe markup is eligible for Google Assistant, there's now a preview tool. And this is a really cool element where, let's say you're a food company, You've got recipes. You cannot see how those recipes are going to display on a Google Assistant, a Google Home, Google Home Max. So you can now run through this um, this this code, and we're going to have it all in the show notes. But see how those recipes will display exactly. And please, awesome. if you're posting a recipe, please do not put your life story before the recipe. I hate that. It's amazing. I I can't stand it. <laughs> so it like, is my <laughs> biggest gripe in life. Honestly, I think so. You're like basil turkey meatballs. <laughs> you get to the first sign. It's like, once upon a time, I was in Delaware. <laughs> it was a cold day. It was a bitter wind blew. But I caught a scent in the air. A scent that drew hope into my soul, invigorated my body, and warmed me up when I needed it most. I went to Dave's Meatballs. And I walked in, and I was engulfed in the sweet smell of marinara, (laughs) mozzarella, and greeted by a friendly little doggo who I boopied on the head. What is it? I got to scroll like... 50 times. I just want to print the recipe. You know, my kids love this recipe. I make it on a Sunday afternoon. It's great for the back to school season. How do you, they tell you how to freeze it before they tell you how to make it. It drives me crazy. It's nuts. It's like, it's too much. I'm with you. I digress. There should be a penalty for that. Give some, start authoring some (gasps) penalties for that. That's what we need. We need to tweet that. Manual actions, manual actions against life stories in your recipes. I agree. This is so important. It really, this might be why this podcast exists. And Hope isn't laughing because she does HelloFresh and she doesn't have to read recipes on the internet. It's so awful. We should give it to Hope. We should take her HelloFresh recipes and write some huge, huge soliloquy before everything. You click on a link for how to make pizza dough and the first line is like, it was a rainy Saturday in 1987 when I was born. It's so bad. It's awful. All right, well, anyway, some 
this this is if you have recipes, this could be considered a recipe for success. Next up, Bing is improving image search with a better understanding of user queries. Bing is already in the BERT game, but they're bringing a multi-granularity matching to image search with their new vector match, attribute match, and best representative query match techniques from the article. Bing Image Search has employed many deep learning techniques to map both query and document into semantic space, greatly improving our search quality. Um, quick hot take on this. Image search is way better on Bing than Google. Really? Really. They link right to the image, which is bad for webmasters. I get that. I feel you. Uh, I Good appreciate it. <laughs> Good for me. Unless I'm the webmaster. And it's just, it, it is actually phenomenal. If you're trying to look for something, do it. I, this is the Greg Finn challenge here. The marketing clock challenge. Try a search on Google and then try it on Bing. Okay. You're going to be blown away. Blown away. It's a, and now we have multi-granularity matching. I mean, attribute match, vector match. It's going to be even better. What more could you ask for? Bert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up, Spotify has a new feature. You may, if you're if you're a power Spotify user like you shop, mm -hmm. you may get recommendations for music. You're now going to get recommendations for podcasts you may enjoy. Have you ever heard of podcasts before? I have. Okay. So you can go to your Spotify. It's kind of hard to find. You were having some yeah. problems with it earlier. Um, but you go to your main Spotify list. You scroll down and you'll see Spot, um, pod, 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 <laughs> Spotify. <laughs> you see podcasts recommended for you. And did you look at the what you were recommended? I did. So I looked at mine, and I only had six recommendations. And I got five out of six were pretty good. One of those was Marketing and Clock, which is like, I mean, that's a no-brainer. Good. I had Pete Holmes and Bob Saget, which I'm a big Bob Saget fan, so that makes sense. <laughs> is that an interview? Yeah, it's an interview. Bob Saget. Do Are you a Saget fan? <laughs> Not particularly, but... Have you listened to Bob Saget content on Spotify before? How would no? I've listened to Pete Holmes before. Okay, but I don't think I did on Spotify, which Interesting. is weird. I'm not a big Spotify podcast user. Uh, another one was Closing Day podcast. Shout out to Kyle Pucko, who's been on the show before. They're like, here's a recap, and I'm like, all right, cool. So that was good. Uh, the one that didn't match mine was a show about podcasters. Like, that's gross. I don't want to hear about but who do you they think I know, am? But they match you well. Who do you think I am, Spotify? I take umbrage with that okay. recommendation. That's disgusting. Honestly, I'm kind of impressed that they knew that. I well, am. probably because you have like an anger account. Well, that's too that's too much information. Give me that that Facebook app. Give me the Zuckerberg meme. I'm making a meme with Spotify as Zuckerberg. Tell me my podcast because they know I'm a podcaster. So, so my, how are yours? Mine were pretty good. The first half were all new episodes of shows that I listened to. So Marketing the Clock was on there too. And then the second half was new ones. And it was a lot of things that had like the host from the shows I listened to on other podcasts. That's cool. And they were pretty well targeted. So they had one called True Crime Girl Time. Whoa. That's like, that seems like you, the podcast. Mm -hmm. One called Over My Dead Body. And Again, you. And then Bubbly Sesh, which is the Hallmark Movie Channel podcast. That's like, that's like the, did they give you any QVC recommendations? They, there's no QVC podcast, I guess. Okay. But I'm really happy about this because on the bottom of my podcast page, I've had Spotify for at least like two years and the same like five podcast recommendations are at the bottom every time it's featured podcast. Like they need to figure it out. Yeah. It's I, a big trend right now like podcasts are huge and they're not doing a good job hopefully they do better the other complaint i have with this is it just has the name of the episode the execution stinks yeah it just has the name of the episode it doesn't have the title of the show you, yeah you're you get you get the name of the podcast and then it's all how about the bio yeah, tell me what what i'm actually going to listen to you get that when you're scrolling the episodes finally one last complaint but also just kudos to you because you write the names of the podcast every week our podcast names are fire. Yeah, they are. So They're maybe fun. that's going to help us. Okay. So I also just have to say, very topical, before we walked in here, I got a notification from Spotify. They're doing it wrong. It says, 2019 Wrapped is coming soon. Replay your top artists of 2018, like Taylor Swift. I mean, they could just put in any year date, and it's going to be Taylor Swift for you. But 2018... 
it's twenty nine. It's my twenty nineteen rap list. Like they do so many things so well, and then just if they would just spend a week with me, I could make it all a lot better. <laughs> Everybody be listening to Taylor <laughs> Swift. No, it's not that. There's just little things like the search isn't great. If you search marketing o'clock without the apostrophe, you can't find it. <laughs> Well, you guys, you better go to your brand new, uh, your new result podcast. What's new on podcasts? But this looks like it's a step in the right direction. I agree. All right. And that is it for this week. And that brings us to our real life segment, straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for Working Hard or Hardly Working, where we talk about what's going on in our IRL work. Good, bad, or otherwise. Chip, what's been happening with your accounts lately? So Mark on our team taught me this cool thing that you can do in Facebook Ads Manager. Mark has lots of cool things on yeah. his team. Yeah, on Facebook mostly, yeah. I don't know a lot about Facebook, so this <laughs> is great. So you can look at two of your audiences in Facebook Ads Manager and see the overlap. So you can do... Um, like a lookalike audience for one pay, for one remarketing list and another one and see the overlap and see how similar they are. That's awesome. Yeah. So you can know if they're super different, maybe you have to make two different campaigns, if it's worth it. That's just a fun little thing. I had no idea existed. And there's a Venn diagram. Right. And it's, it's kind of like, it, it's almost, you give a number, we use a 40% number, or Mark uses a 40% number. And if things are more than 40% the same, it probably doesn't justify making a new ad group to target everything. Yeah. Which is awesome. Cool. And just one thing I had is that we had a couple of accounts where I was trying to do not top of page bidding, but just first page bidding on. And I ran through and I moved everything to first page bidding in Google Ads Editor on Google Ads. The numbers were astronomical. There's no way they were correct. It was like six hundred dollars. Yeah. I'm looking at this and I'm like, what is this? Why I, are you saying that? Like, I, what could this possibly be? I always do it, and then I sort by highest bid for sure. To check them. So if you're out there and you think that just because at one time it worked and it was really nice, it is broken beyond repair at this point. It is not usable. If you do anything, you need to double, triple check it. Don't you use first page bidding in Google Ads Editor? And I mean, I didn't even try it, but I would say for sure, don't do top of page bidding. Microsoft be, too. So don't, really don't do that. It used to be a really cool thing where you could find out what it takes to be there. You could drop those bids slightly and then you could, again, bump them up gradually if you're doing CPC or eCPC. No more. Don't do it. Crazy. Now it's time for this week's WTH. Misguided. You're like, who does that? <laughs> Just get rid of it. I'm over it. <laughs> Where we rant, rave, and roll our eyes about a trending digital marketing topic. What are we coming to? Honestly. See what had us asking. W-T-H. This week. This week's WTH comes from Search Engine Journal, and it's not just because we are partnered with them. It's because Roger Monti, a.k.a. Martini Buster, has a fantastic article. The heckiest article of the week. The heckiest article of the week. And I had no idea that this was even possible. <laughs> he says, dot org registry sold to an investment firm. I'm like, oh, weird. Like, you probably bought a whole slew of domains. Mm -hmm. Oh, they bought the domain. <laughs> Shep, they bought the domain. The nonprofit organization that manages the dot org domain registry has been sold to a for-profit investment firm. It's not just a for-profit company. It's an investment firm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I've got lots of questions. So some are fearful that the .org domains cost will now rise because an investment firm owns it. Yeah, it seems like a valid concern. I agree. So maybe I'm dumb. I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know that there was just somebody that owned the .org. I had no idea. That could ship it. I actually, for some reason I, I like i know there's a lot of for-profit things there's a lot of countries that own specific domains um top level domains i didn't know that somebody owned dot org i could just either. sell it so who owns dot com it's a great question i don't know that one either <laughs> but i i i was so perplexed reading this article that this is the case so i can ruled this year that the cost of a .org domain, which typically people thought of as like, you're an organization, you're American Cancer Organization. I thought it was free. 
anyway. <laughs> that dot org was free. It's not. <laughs> no, it's, it's not free, but it's also not going to be capped at a set amount. Okay. So it used to be capped. I can say, no, it's not going to be capped anymore. And so that raised the opportunity for people to raise the price of a dot org. So that happened. And then this non for profit that owned dot org sold it to the investment firm. So the thought is, well, an investment firm is probably going to go Martin Scarley on this thing mm -hmm. and just jack that price right up. So I got another thing. Maybe I'm an idiot, but I don't understand how nonprofits work. The Public Interest Registry, PIR, had managed .org and then sold it to the firm Ethos Capital. Somebody made money somewhere. How are you not in yeah. for profit? Like, where does the profit go? Like, they how does that work? They pay their employees, like, for sure. The, the NFL is a nonprofit. It is? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Like, I don't Like, it seems wrong. Yeah. And you could just sell this thing? But they for, could. I'm sure the, the only reason they sold it is because somebody said, now we can make more profit. And I'm assuming they then took it and made a profit. Where does the profit go? Well, they could be using it for their, whatever their nonprofit is, like charity... I don't know, to have better snacks at the NFL games. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, the according to the press release, the transaction becomes final during the first quarter of 2020. So if you own a .org and you're looking to secure it for a longer time, buy a 10-year yeah. period now. It's capped. You're going to get the same price. Re-up it now for 10 years. Give yourself a little leverage. And then it's honestly, at some point, you have to get off that dot .org. Mm -hmm. like that, that .org is no longer for, org, for, for like the good, the, the greater cause. I real, I, my eyes were so open by this. I thought it was owned by like the government and they were free and they were for nonprofits. Nope. No, I, I thought it was some government base or ICANN base that's for organizations. I know you could buy a .org, SEO Miles used to be SEO Miles .org. Okay. But I don't know. Crazy. And now for this week's cool tool. As a reminder, our cool tool segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something we found in our travels that may be of use to our listeners and is really, really cool. This week's cool tool is also asked.com and it allows you to type in a keyword and it charts out search queries related to your keyword so you can understand how people are researching that topic. So you're saying it's also asked.com also, also asked asked with a K. one word a l s o a s k e d dot com we will gotcha. have it in the show notes do they have a dot org no it's also asked.com cool and instead of using suggest data like other sites they use people also ask data which provides results for more long tail searches and shows up as relationships between these topics and questions so more BERT oriented, we might say, these long tail keywords. So this seems like a great tool. I actually used it today researching. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, um, do you ever type something into Google and see like the suggested options to try to do a keyword research a little bit? Yes. It's like a back end thing. Yep. I tried this instead today and it was cool. It maps it out really logically. You can export it as a PDF. You know, I love those. Oh, for sure. Or as an image. So check it out. We will link to it in our show notes. Now it's time for our must-read marketing article of the week. An article so advanced, so in-depth, so detailed, that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show. All right, this week's must-read marketing article of the week is, I'm taking a different flavor. I've got two, and in reality I've got four, but two you should never read. Okay. There used to be a eat this, not that segment in men's health where you'd say, oh, don't eat a banana. Instead, eat a candy bar or something. You'd be like, oh, I didn't know that. Candy bars are better than bananas. Or <laughs> don't eat a cauliflower, eat an apple or something. And they explain why. Okay. So I'm doing it this time. So read this, not that. So first off, in case you're hiding under a rock, there's a huge expose in the Wall Street Journal called How Google Interferes with Its Search Algorithms and Changes Your Results. Don't read that. Don't eat that. I think you have to pay for a subscription anyway. So if you don't, it's if not you, even a question. If you, don't have if, you say, <laughs> if you search it and click from Google, you'll get first click free still. 
But they misquoted friend of the show, Glenn Gabe, who is... What a travesty. It's, it's beyond. It's beyond reproach. How and, dare they? So Glenn was talking about what an algorithm is like and, and mentioned it like a black box where you don't, where it kind of stores things. You can't actually see how everything works. Mm-hmm. And they said it's black magic. They quoted him as saying Google's like black magic. Like Glenn's all in there in the dark arts. <laughs> like well, what is going on? And then there's a crazy rebuttal over on Search Engine Land of Barry Schwartz. He wrote an article called Misquoted and Misunderstood. Why many in the search community don't believe the WSJ about Google search. It was scathing. Did you read that article? I did. At one point, he said, what the Wall Street Journal published to me is either showing how it has a complete lack of understanding of search, or even worse, the publication has its own agenda against Google, which honestly makes me sad. And Barry's like the nice guy, too. Like, Glenn yeah. and Barry are, are, are search treasures. And they've... That ain't again, right. They've, they've dragged their names through the mud. We need a Facebook meme of Glenn in like a warlock outfit. Yeah. Doing we'll, his black magic. We'll do that and we'll put it in the show notes. Okay. <laughs> Glenn in the dark arts will come out. <laughs> so anyway, don't read the Wall Street Journal and any of that the travesty there, that fake news. Those, it's basically a written deep fake. Mm-hmm. So instead, <laughs> you read this. Brands versus ads by Aaron Wall, an SEO book. Aaron is a treasure in the space he stopped blogging, he stopped posting everything, he stopped everything for a long time. I think it was like, he stopped in like 2016. He came back with some fire this year. This article is how you take something down. He just uses logic and reason and facts. And something he's been saying since like the Vince update that he <laughs> talks about brands and what Google's doing. It's a phenomenal article. It talks about the fact that as long as you have two competitors in Google, it's, it's me too offering about how markets evolve towards promoting brands in general. He quotes people that made really bad mistakes and then, not mad, just had awful takes and then where they are today. So he brought out a quote that said, since the Motorola debacle, it was Google's largest acquisition after the 676 million purchase of ITA software, which became Google Flights. Uh, remember that? Does anybody use that instead of Travelocity or one of the many others? Neither do I. So he quoted that article and then brought today's reality into it saying, Travelocity has rough, had roughly 3,000 people on the payroll globally as recently a couple of years ago. But the Travelocity workforce has been whittled to around 50 employees in North America. It's like, yeah, they know what they're doing. Wow. And he breaks it down. It's amazing. Talks about Chrome ad blocking and why it behooves Google. He's got fire saying Google buys entire businesses, guts them, and sells them for parts. Google's core business model is selling paid links with even lighter disclosure, which is true. Look at Google Shopping. Some he, he didn't say that part. I said that part. Some SEOs suggest selling links or exposures beneath them, but ex Google employees leverage their past gains to buy well linked sites like money.com. That's how you do a takedown. Dude, you want a bone to pick? Wall Street Journal? Check out Aaron's article. Read that. Educate I'm doing another yourself. one. I'm doing another one too. Okay. I'm fired up this week. I'm ready. This is going to be the longest podcast yet, but it's great. <laughs> Good content. So what you don't want to read is bad content on the correspondent.com. They had an article called the new dot-com bubble is here. It's called online advertising, which is the cringiest title ever. Many people sent this to me and I, my, I like just it. rolled your eye, rolled my eyes, listeners. My response. <laughs> Very dramatically. I'll pull this up. My response was this thing reads like a Bill Simmons article. It's meandering. It doesn't make a point. It might as well be a recipe article <laughs> talking about <laughs> people's excursions overseas uh, is a trip is a trip abroad. Like it is, they talk about eBay buying branded terms and not seeing a lift in sales. Like, uh, uh, no way. <laughs> and then, so don't read that article. Okay. It's a terrible article. It's weird. It doesn't make a point. It actually looks really nice. If you want to know how to like format an article, read that but don't really read it. Instead, read an article on Search Engine Land from former guest on the show, Kirk Williams. Kirk Williams wrote, digital advertising is not the dot-com bubble. Improper attribution is. Ooh. This is such a sensible article. <laughs> it didn't get enough play in my mind. You read this and it's a, a logical breakdown of this stupid article from The Correspondent. And he talks about the fact where he says, this is where I disagreed with the article. 
Authors blame the failure of marketers and engineers to actually demonstrate incremental value on digital advertising itself, rather than the tactics devised from improper understanding of attribution. He's got, wait, what's in there? And he says, here's what I mean. Digital advertising is just advertising. It's not the greatest thing to ever happen in marketing, and it's not a bubble. It's just advertising. It's like, this is logic. Mm -hmm. And so another article, another quote from the article is what Kirk said is, when you think you can track everything, you begin to shift your time, resources, tools, and reporting to make your trackable KPIs grow rather than building and implementing the tactics to accomplish an actual marketing strategy within your digital channel. And if you read the article, that was the first thing I thought when I read about eBay in this correspondent piece. It's like, this doesn't make sense, and you can't make any conclusions from this, and this isn't a marketing strategy, and Kirk nailed it. So those are two things to read instead of what you see in the mainstream media. Okay. We'll take your word for it. Thank you, Kirk and Aaron. All right. That does it for today's show. Thank you to Search Engine Journal. If you are a PPCer or you do any kind of digital advertising, go download the report, the 2020 PPC report. You can get it at searchenginejournal.com forward slash PPC dash trends dash 2020. 39 experts, 150 pages. Even if you don't want to download the PDF for yourself, maybe you're not like you, the PDF connoisseur, you can still read a very detailed article that breaks out a lot of the high points on there. So check that out. You do, don't want to miss that. SearchEngineJournal.com forward slash PPC dash trends dash 2020. And if you're looking for another great podcast, don't miss this week's episode of the Search Engine Journal show. Yep. This week they have John Mueller of Google. Wow. It's a pretty cool interview. Danny talks about how John got into Google, some of the rationale behind it, some day-to-day -day stuff. He tries to get him to break some news. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil it. You're gonna have to listen to it yourself. The Search Engines Journal Show. Check it out. It is now officially not Marketing O'Clock. Remember, you can catch everything from this show on marketingoclock.com. While you're there, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week. <laughs>